The, uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, two pieces of paper that you probably picked up. One is a report from last week from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities entitled Boehner Proposal Would Cut Non-Security Discretionary Programs 21%, the deepest such cut in recent U.S. history. And then a, a, a report I did where I took what they concluded about the cuts necessary and applied them uh, to New York called Federal Tax Policy at a Crossroads. Uh, so just the background of what the situation is. Why are there these long list of tax cuts that are scheduled to expire? Uh, the, the tax cuts were originally enacted in 2001, 2003, and 2009. The 2001 and 2003 uh, tax cuts that uh, were enacted under President Bush expired in 2010 so that they could avoid the rules in the Senate requiring 60 votes. So they did it through reconciliation so they could do it with a simple majority of those president voting rather than with 60 votes. So because of that, they couldn't do the tax cuts permanently. So they did them so they would expire in 2010. But the, the tax cuts include reductions in the rates, in all the rates in the bracket structure, so it affects people across the, uh, the income distribution. Uh, the cuts also included a ending of a reduction in itemized deductions for wealthy people, uh, phased out the estate tax, uh, a, lo a long list of breaks. The position that President Obama took during the campaign was that the, the, the tax cuts should be made permanent uh, for single people with incomes up to $200,000 and married couples with incomes up to $250,000. So that was the position he took during the campaign, and it's still his position, which is saying that the Congress should act to make a portion of the tax cuts permanent. That would in, now th there are certain tax cuts for the wealthy under the president's proposal, and the reason for that uh, is that the people with high incomes, just like people with middle incomes, benefit from the reduction in the lower rates. So the the high income people will still get a tax cut, but not as much as they would if the rate reduction in the top rates was included. If you look at the uh, uh, Next to the last page of the report, uh, you, you, you can see uh, estimates from the Institute on Taxation and Economic Policy of the impact of the, uh, the tax cuts by income group. And the, the difference is the, the top 1% of New Yorkers, New Yorkers with average incomes of about $2.3 million, get substantial tax cuts under the uh, president's plan. They're just not as big as the tax cuts they would re receive under the Republican plan for extending all of the uh, the tax cuts. It's the difference between 120,000 uh, and 40,000. The uh, so why is it that we are suggesting that the uh, the tax cuts for the wealthy not be extended? One, they're very costly. Karen mentioned uh, that the income tax cuts alone uh, will cost about 700 million over the next 10 years. The estate tax cuts another 100 million. So those two tax cuts alone, 800 million dollars over 10 years. Expanding, extending the Bush tax cuts for the rich would limit the resources available for job creation now and for balanced budgets and improved economy in the long run. The, extending the 2001 and 2003 tax cuts would also perpetuate money, many unfair aspects of the federal tax system. Uh, the example we use in the report is the much lower tax on capital gains and dividends than on wages and salaries that people work for. The result is that continuing very low rates of taxation on capital gains and dividends allows very wealthy taxpayers to pay federal income taxes at lower effective rates than middle income people with incomes that come from wages and salaries. Many middle income and low income taxpayers do better under the president's proposal than under the Republicans' proposal because the president is also proposing to make per, per, permanent some changes to the Bush tax cuts that were enacted as part of the Recovery Act on a temporary basis for two years, making the child tax credit more available to lower and moderate income families and improving the earned income tax credit for families with three or more children and for married families. 
And finally, making the back Bush tax cuts for the wealthy permanent would limit the resources available for funding successful federal programs. That the other shoe has now fallen with uh, Congressman Boehner, minority, Republican Minority Leader John Boehner's plan. Uh, he is for making the tax cuts permanent, but as a bargaining position, he has offered a plan that would do a two-year extension of, the, uh, of all the tax cuts, but it would also, it, it, I guess in a gesture at fiscal responsibility, freeze total discretionary spending by the federal government at one billion and 29 million. But he would exempt defense, homeland security, military construction, and veterans appropriations bills, and those programs account for 651 million of the discretionary spending, so that leaves 378 million to play with. In order to, re to achieve his le level of spending, in the fiscal year that starts just in a few weeks uh, on October 1st, 2010, it would require that all of the other discretionary spending in the budget be cut by about 21.7%. On the last page of our report, uh, page five, we, we take uh, a, a series of federal programs, successful and well-tested federal programs that have existed for many years and show what their funding level is at two th in 2011 fiscal year, which is very similar to the 2010 level adjusted for inflation, and what the expected share for New York is. And then we show what the impact of the 21.7% cut would be. Now, they could still accomplish that same level of spending by cutting some programs more than others, but this is saying what would happen if they did it across the board and didn't choose some winners and some losers. It would mean a cut in one year of 100 million for the WIC program, the Women's Infant and Children program in New York. A 270 million cut next year in Title I education grants. That's the main federal uh, aid program for needy school districts. 168, 67 million cut next year in New York alone for special education. That's 2.6 billion nationally. Adoption assistance, 550 million nationally. 56 million in New York. Child care and development block grant, one of the ways of funding child care, 635 million nationally, 30 million in New York. So if the Bush, if the extension of the Bush tax cuts is done in a fiscally responsible manner, it means big cuts for important and well-tested and well-established programs that <coughs> middle and lower income New Yorkers and middle and lower income New, uh, Americans depend upon. We're going to hear uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation about some of the specific subject areas, and we'll save questions till the end. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. I think it's pretty clear from Frank's presentation that given the $6 billion impact on New York State and on um, you know, people throughout the entire state, why over 80 national organizations have joined the Americans for Responsible Taxation, and nearly 30 groups in New York have also joined ARC. Um, I wanted to, we're next going to hear from Ron Deutsch from New Yorkers for Fiscal Fairness. Thanks, Karen. <coughs> and thank you, uh, Frank, for laying out all those numbers for us and doing that detailed analysis. Uh, I think we're realizing we're at a point right now where we have about 850,000 New Yorkers unemployed uh, and under Minority Leader Bonner's plan that's going to cut about $6 billion from programs and services to New York which is what Frank just talked about in terms of the dollar figures per program. Uh, we can ill afford to have that happen right now, especially since we're also looking at multi-billion dollar deficits uh, into the future. Uh, but I'd like to put this in a little bit of perspective, if I can, um, and look historically at the income tax rates, the federal income tax rates uh, uh, over the years. And uh, I think what we need to realize is right now we're talking about going a top rate going from about 36% to about 39%. That is not a monumental leap right now, but it does, would save uh, Americans a significant amount, billions and billions of dollars if we don't let these uh, tax cuts uh, continue uh, for the wealthiest 2%. So think about this, in 1950, uh, the top tax rate for the wealthiest Americans was 91%. Uh, that dropped in 1967 to about 70%, and then in 1982, under Reagan, to about 50%. Uh, 
Uh, so historically, I think, you know, the wealthy are still doing very well at the top rates, uh, given that context. So I think this notion that uh, the wealthy are truly overburdened by taxation is, is simply uh, ridiculous uh, and not in fact true. And in fact, these policies uh, and this erosion of the progressivity of the personal income tax and the top marginal rates have resulted in a very high concentration of wealth in the hands of a very few in this country. I think one of the um, handouts in the back shows the net worth and financial wealth uh, distribution in the U.S. Uh, just a couple of years ago. And what we realize is the top 1% of Americans control the same financial wealth, or have about 43% of all the financial wealth in this country. So 1% owns 43% of the financial wealth, while the bottom 80% control 7% of the financial wealth. Uh, that, to me, uh, speaks to the need for substantive tax reform. What we're doing right now is just kind of tinkering around the edges, albeit very important tinkering. Uh, we need to substantively look at reforming the federal tax code uh, and also look at our state uh, tax code uh, and try and move to more of a trickle-up approach rather than a trickle-down approach to economics. Uh, one of the problems with uh, allowing these tax cuts uh, to continue for the very wealthy is the fact that we know people on the bottom end of the socioeconomic ladder spend their money. They spend their money on goods and services. People at the top end will save their money or put it into speculative investment. That's not going to create the kind of jobs that we need right now. We need substantive job creation. And by providing people uh, at the bottom ends of the, the socioeconomic rungs with uh, resources, uh, that is what's going to spark this economy and get it moving again. And they will spend their money in this economy. So just wanted to put things in a little bit of perspective, but I think now you're going to hear from a lot of folks who are running programs in this state, so uh, the consequences are potentially even more dire there. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. Um, are they Igel from Pat? My name is Arlia Igo, and I'm Secretary and Treasurer for the Public Employees Federation. We represent the professional scientific and technical workers of New York State. I'm sure you're all familiar with that because we've been vilified over and over in the press about how we are the problem. We are not the problem. We are the middle class in this state, along with all the other unionized and non-unionized workers the people you see in your market, the people when you go to the store, the people you see when you go to the gas station, they can ill afford what has been talked about here today by Frank and Ron. Um, this isn't a fight over tax cuts. This is a fight for the survival of the middle class in our country. Many of our neighbors, friends, and families are hanging on by a thread through this recession only to see factions in Congress plotting to cut the strings of America's safety net to fund tax cuts for the wealthiest 2%. What happened to we will take care of our own in this country? What happened to we will take our poor, we will find jobs, we will take care of people? It seems to have gotten lost. The rich are going to take care of the rich, and the poor are going to be out on the streets. In this country, to see a block from the White House, people living in cardboard boxes, we should be ashamed, very ashamed. And it's all over. You can go out downtown here and see the same thing. We need to take care of our people. We need to pay more attention to these tax cuts. We need to make the rich responsible for their share and stop talking about those of us that are the middle class and are doing more than they are. We need to come together and we need to solve this problem and hopefully Together we will, but I'm afraid that what's going to happen is we're going to be a country that has two classes, the rich and the poor. There will be no middle class. Thank you. Thank you, Arlia. And I think that's, Arlia's really, you know, gotten to the core point here, which is that these tax cuts for the wealthy are going to mean the kind of cuts that really um, increase our income inequality in this country and in the state. And the six billion cuts in New York will severely impact New York. New Yorkers individually and, and impact our communities in a way where we're going to see the recession get even worse. I mean, at a time when we have 
over ten, around 10% 10 unemployment, and a time when people are struggling to stay in the middle class, um, we really can't afford to give tax cuts to the wealthy and increase that income inequality. Robert Rice, our former Secretary of Labor, and a lot of other leading economists have talked about the fact that that growing in income inequality is what's destroying our economy overall. Um, and the, the kind of cuts that we're looking at here for New York State, if the ban proposal, are going to have a very significant impact, particularly on school children. Nikki Jones from the Alliance for Quality Education is going to share a little more with us about that. Good afternoon. I am Nikki Jones with the Alliance for Quality Education. We are a statewide coalition fighting for quality public education. Uh, for far too long, the federal government has failed to back the, the programs to ensure that every child has an opportunity to learn. And instead of backing these policies designed for that purpose, they've instead protected the pockets of the wealthy as opposed to protecting the children who are our future. The Obama administration is currently uh, making strategic investments to improve our students' future. Uh, however, we still need Americans who are making over $200,000 a year to uh, pay their fair share so we can stop leaving so many children behind. Um, quality teaching initiatives, professional development, math, reading, tutoring, advanced placement, these are the kinds of programs that cost money. There's no other way to say that they cost money, but the, uh, the, the payoff from this investment is huge. There, in fact, there is no greater investment. Preparing students for successful careers so that they're, they're graduating on time and they're going into the workforce will fuel our community, our state, and our country. Uh, allowing these tax cuts for the wealthy to expire will help to begin to close the achievement gap that we see currently in our, between our low needs and our high needs districts. Uh, so the federal government has an obligation to protect our children's future. Better to do so is a disservice to our country. Thank you, Nikki. And to talk about the impact on senior citizens, Dennis Tracy with the New York State Alliance for Retired Americans. My name is Dennis Tracy. I'm executive director of the New York State Alliance for Retired Americans. Um, we are affiliated with the AFL-CIO as well as community groups, grass uh, roots, uh, to protect the rights of retirees. Um, I'd just like to uh, thank uh, Citizen Action and, and again for the job that Frank and that, uh, Ron did in explaining the information. Um, also, I'd like to go back and just point out again that we're talking about 2001 when these push cuts came about. That was after a roaring economy of the 1990s when we were at a surplus. So you go from a surplus mentality to today's deficit mentality, and there's a huge, huge difference. So to paraphrase a, um, a network that I only watch on Sunday to watch football, <laughs> these cuts are unfair and unbalanced. We're talking about the government losing trillions of dollars. Trillions of dollars. That's their income. They're just going to give it up. When they give it up, that money just doesn't come to the state anymore, and as has been said, six million uh, billion dollars in the state of New York would be lost. It's morally wrong, it's ethically wrong. We have seniors, like so many other New Yorkers, retirees, who are struggling to get by. And if the cuts become uh, law, and, and these cuts, I, I don't think should have a person's name, but um, maybe should be called the bonehead if they were allowed to continue and they were to pass. They would affect low-income retirees. They would lose uh, supplemental assistance for uh, heat. They would lose health care and other programs that are vital to their survival. So we encourage all not to in, uh, allow these cuts to be renewed. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. And our final speaker is Denise Harlow from the New York State Community Action Center. Last week, a report was issued that talked about the rise in poverty, both in New York State and across this country. We now have more than 3 million New Yorkers living in poverty. Next week, we'll see more city-specific information. The cuts that are listed here in terms of the impact on New York State will be impacting programs that serve families who can least afford any sort of impact in their, in their daily lives. The poverty rates would have been higher had it not been for the earned income tax credit, for the child tax credit. These are programs that lift families literally above the poverty line into an ability to provide for their families. We're talking about programs that cut WIC, infant formula for, for, for new babies, healthy foods for new moms. We're talking cuts to Head Start programs. Many of our community action agencies run Head Start programs. They've been invested in through the stimulus program to serve additional children who need safe, solid education places to go during the day, which also provides their parents the chance to go to work. 
Custody programs will have real impact on our families' daily lives, and we can't afford for that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. So all of us here today think that there's a pretty clear choice. You've got tax cuts for the rich and more pain for, for working New Yorkers, or um, stop the giveaways to the, to the wealthiest Americans and fund the programs that are essential to our economic recovery. And we think it's a pretty simple choice, and we call upon our congressional delegation, especially our two senators, Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand, to extend tax cuts for, for middle class Americans and to end the tax giveaways to the wealthiest Americans. With that, we'll uh, take questions. Do you have any sense of how the senators are going to vote on this, as, as well as members of the congressional delegation? Yeah, uh, do you want to speak to that? Um, you know, New York, I mean, our New York delegation in general has been very good on this issue, and so while, you know, different proposals are floating right now and no one's made very specific commitments, we would expect that our senators and most of our congressional delegation would support the president's plan. But we're having today's press conference to just really reinforce how important that is and to let them know as well as to let the public know how important this vote will be in the future of New York's economy. But we would expect that our delegation would be very strong on this. In, in Congress? Um, same. Uh, you know, again, we don't have, we don't, I don't have like point by point things, but generally the Democrats in Congress are supporting the President's plan. There's a couple of New Yorkers that haven't made specific decisions yet, but we, again, call upon them to support the President's plan, to oppose the Bader plan, and we uh, expect and hope that that will happen. Yeah, the only uh, member of the New York delegation who has joined in the effort to, uh, to extend all the tax cuts for two years is uh, Congressman McMahon from Staten Island. So none of the other, uh, it was, a, it was a letter by Democrats who took that position. It was a relatively small number. Uh, but, you know, the 27 Democrats in the New York delegation, he was the only one who signed on to that letter. Have you received a firm expression of opinion from Scott Murphy? Uh, no, I, I haven't done anything. Uh, Anybody? Said, you know, uh, but I, what I'm asking is uh, Murphy's Republican opponent, Chris Gibson, is very outspoken calling for everyone to get the tax yeah. rate, which would include the rich people. Yeah, I, I haven't spoken to Murphy, but at the debates so far, he has indicated that he would favor uh, extending the tax cuts for everyone except the people above the threshold that the president is proposing. So he said that in the debates. And, and he's made clear in the debates and other statements that he's taking that position because of the impact on New Yorkers if they extend the tax cuts for the wealthy and on his district directly. There'll be huge impacts if we extend the tax cuts for the wealthiest Americans. And so that's why um, Congress Murphy has joined with the rest of our delegate, most of the rest of our delegation, in saying we've got to extend tax cuts for middle class Americans, but not for the wealthiest. So the entire cut went through and cost the state six billion. Well, well, billion. Yeah, what this is is, uh, uh, you know, this is in effect if you took a fiscally responsible position, and this is uh, John Boehner has uh, put forth a plan. You know, while he's really, you know, he acknowledges that he's for extending the tax cuts permanently. He floated a plan last week that would uh, extend all the tax cuts for two years and uh, cap uh, discretionary spending at for the fiscal year that starts October 1st at $1 billion, $29 million. Uh, What that would require nationally are cuts of about $101 billion. Uh, what our estimate is, is in some programs, New York receives more than 6% of the federal aid and other programs it receives less. But on average, that New York receives about 6% of the aid uh, under these discretionary programs. And so if the uh, 101 billion cut was to go ahead, that uh, we think it's a, a conservative estimate to say New York would be hit by, by at least 6 billion of that cut. And what we did include in the next to last page of our report is a table where for some of the, uh, the programs that are affected, we've indicated what the amount is that the president's asked for for the year that starts October 1st, how much is estimated to go to New York, and what the 21.7% cut across the board would mean for both New York and the U.S. And as I explained in my initial presentation, this is if the 21.7% cut was applied equally across the board. You could save the same amount of money by cutting some programs more and some programs less. But it's a very, the, the issue is that it's a very small portion of the federal budget that's being targeted for these cuts. I think Frank's report on the, and analysis of this is, is very, very important because it's very easy for candidates to go out there and say they want tax cuts. And we see lots of candidates, you know, he gave the example of Chris Gibson out there talking about tax cuts, but they haven't been willing to say, if we cut these taxes, what's going to be the cost? And Frank's analysis shows a very clear example of what kind of pain it's going to cause New Yorkers if we continue these tax giveaways to the wealthiest Americans. 
It's what? the whole discretionary. What was the number? Yeah, it, uh, it's one trillion. One, uh, one trillion, right. twenty-nine. Right. Uh, yeah, where it is, it, the whole, it's all laid out in detail, okay. Rick, in the uh, short paper from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities. Is one of the handouts. And it explains the uh, overall proposal. And then what we did is took their conclusion nationally and said, what would this mean if we applied this conclusion to the expected shares that New York would get from various programs that would be on this hit list? Well, one of the reasons Tea Party candidates seem to be doing so well this year is they're attacking spending uh, in general. And obviously, since there is such a huge deficit on the federal level, uh, you can make the argument there shouldn't be any uh, lower rate that uh, the legislation that Congress passed in 2001 ought to just continue and, and right. raise the rates for everybody. Right. The, uh, uh, your the, thoughts on that? Well, uh, what, uh, what we described uh, are the two main positions of the political contestants, that the president in the campaign, and you know, he's been consistent, you know, he chose the 200,000, 250,000 level, and he has been consistent that he wants to make the tax cuts for the middle class and lower income people permanent and end the tax cuts for people with incomes above those levels. The, uh, the Senate Republican leadership introduced a bill last week where they put their cards on the table and said extend all the Bush and uh, Bush tax cuts from 2001 and 2003 but extend none of the 2009 cuts which help lower and middle income people. That's why in terms of the distributional impact, the Obama plan, even though it uses less tax revenue, uh, would, gives more relief to people in the bottom 80% of the population. You're answering a question I didn't ask. You no, know, no, but I'm leading up to it. So there, there, are, there are clearly people, uh, Alan Greenspan, for example, who, who say, you know, so-called deficit hawks, who say sunset all the tax cuts now. Peter Orzag, who had recently left as Obama's budget director, we, we point out in the report, has taken the position that it's so important to end the tax cuts permanently that he thinks that it would be worth agreeing to a two-year extension of all the tax cuts if that meant a firm commitment to sunset them all in two years. Boehner, John Boehner, the minority leader, has called for the two-year extension, but he has also been honest enough to say he wants permanent repeal. So there's a range of, uh, of opinions. Does the president's position to uh, continue the tax cuts for the middle class and lower income people make sense? Uh, we think it makes sense because of the changing income distribution in the country and that middle and lower income people have been squeezed while the wealth had been concentrated at the top. And so we think that it is not illogical on an ability to pay basis to try to correct some of these inequities. Other questions? Yeah, how are you going to be working with, uh, I guess I want to say either, or are you, I guess, working with New York legislators or uh, Congressman Gillibrand and Schumer? Um, or I guess uh, in addition to that, uh, who in New York or in Congress or whatever are uh, the good, our, our support of this issue. So, I mean, all of our groups and the other groups that are members of um, the American Responsible Taxation have been communicating with the members of Congress and our senators you know, our strong concerns on this issue and our strong support um, for the President's plan and the tax cuts on people with incomes over $250,000. Um, and we'll con be continuing to do that both at sort of as organizations communicating and then also asking our members to communicate um, their opposition to continuing tax cuts for the wealthy. and. Um, Especially this week, as these, you know, business rules are potentially getting closer, we're doing a lot of communication from our memberships um, to our congressional delegation and our senators. And of course, the Washington groups are doing that um, in DC as well. And we're holding events like this to educate the public as well. Other questions? Is, it, is this online? Um, Tomorrow? Uh, yeah, Bob's that posted on is the website? Have, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, the report is posted on the city's national. Yeah, it's on our website also. Yeah. Right, but it's both places. Thanks, everybody.